Paul, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, it was just earlier um, when we were mentioning um, Adam, and I, I was just wondering there, um, something I hadn't given much thought to before, that when the angelic realm and, and the angelic beings were made, they were kind of instantly knowing or, you know, not for, is it full knowledge or was Adam in that state as well before the fall he would have been as aware say as an angel is, is that yeah, well, you, you, when you see the angelic hosts in heaven and the anointing that they carried and Adam Adam was without sin and when you look at Eve some people have a problem with the immaculate conception Protestants have a problem with the immaculate conception that the Blessed Mother was born without sin. But if the Blessed Mother is the new Eve, then the original Eve was an immaculate conception. The original Eve was created without sin. So if Mary is the new Eve, she then she must too also be created without sin. So Adam and Eve were carrying an anointing, the presence of God. Everything from Genesis right through to the book of Revelation is about relationship. Adam didn't lose so much the earth, he lost the presence. He lost this glory that he, he walked in such glory. And that's why at the transfiguration, when Jesus is bathed in light as the last Adam, most scholars believe that Adam was bathed in light. Psalm 8. Can you read Psalm 8? Psalm 8 explains that to us. That's a good question, uh, Paul. Because Adam was the God of this world. He was given the small g. This planet to have dominion, rule, and authority. Can you hear me okay? Psalm 8. So we're asking, Paul's asking, was, was Adam like the angelic hosts? Let's read Psalm 8. What From does the it beginning. say, Sean? Yeah. O Lord, our God, how great is your name throughout the earth and your glory in the heavens above. Even the mouths of children and infants exalt your glory in front of your foes and put to shame enemies and rebels. Mm -hmm. When I observe the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars you set in their place, what is man that you be mindful of him, the son of man that you should care for him? Yes, you made him a little lower than the angels. Mm -hmm. You crowned him with glory and honor mm -hmm. and gave him the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, sheep and oxen without number, and even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all that swim the paths of the ocean. O Lord, our Lord, how great is your name all over the earth. Wow. He put all things under his feet. And most scholars believe, like the transfiguration, when Jesus was transfigured and he shone and the light was beaming out of his whole body like Moses. When Moses was in the tent of meeting, the scripture tells us, he came back and his face was shining. It was like his face was transfigured and he had to put a veil over his face. Because it was in the presence of God. So most scholars believe that Adam, when he walked in the cool of the day, he was surrounded by light. So when he fell, the glory lifted, and then he knew he was naked. That's how he knew he was naked. Because he was so totally surrounded by the light and the glory of God. And that's what we're called to do. We have been renewed to walk in that same glory as the first Adam and the last Adam when Jesus said you will do greater things than I 
the God who shares, he shares his glory. Not with other gods. You know, some people get mixed up. God doesn't share his glory. God doesn't share his glory with gods, but he shares his glory with us. Because John 17 says, Lord, Father, the glory you gave me, give to them. God wants us to be blessed, anointed, and grow from glory to glory to glory. I was just sharing with John at lunchtime when I first met Jim. I realised this this man's this man's special. I know he's, I thought he was mad, <laughs> but I thought there's something special about this guy. And I could sense when I first got to know him in January and February and March, and in March he was he was watching from inside his house. And then the Sunday afternoon I went through and we sat and we were talking. And the Friday night, I went in on the Friday night. And he said, would you slow down? I've got 21 pages of notes. Slow, remember, remember he told me here, slow down. What was that scripture? Say that scripture again. And there was something about Jim that was not competitive. Sometimes in ministry... People can compete, but we're called to complete one another, not compete with one another. And when you're walking in love, there's no competition. And that's the mark of maturity, that Jim had the humility to take notes while I was teaching, and he was a Bible teacher. In fact, I was saying to John, I remember one day I was sitting in here and, and Jim was preaching and I thought, oh, I've got to write this to him, you know. And he's like, even Terry's writing notes. <laughs> the humility. That's a mark of maturity because there's no competition in the kingdom. And I got that right away. I knew this man's a man of God. This man's a mature man. Because in ministry, I've seen so much competition. And sometimes we're clergy. They get a wee bit jealous and competitive. And but thank God the clergy that's been coming here, they were true men of God and honoured Jim and loved Jim and realised the gift in his life. So that's the mark of maturity. There's no competition in the kingdom. We're called to complete, not compete. So see my husband and wives. We're not called to compete with your wife or your husband. You're called to complete your husband and complete your wife. That's why we need each other so much. Amen. Amen. Any other comments or questions? Or? Yes. Here we go again, Mrs. I can't get away from Sorry. You can't get away from Adam. No. <laughs> the new Adam. The new Adam. What is it? Adam named all the animals yes. and the fish and everything else. And when you read that and you read it again, I'm just thinking, so he had he was infused with all knowledge. Yep. Incredible. I mean how how what a great fall. Mm-hmm. What a great we're thing. in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's great. That's a good point. Some scholars like reckon he took about six days to announce the animals. Thousands and thousands and thousands of different kinds of animals. And he named them. And the reason why God told him that was because God was showing him that through your words, God created everything by his word. In the beginning was the word, remember? Everything in God's kingdom begins with the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was God, the word was with God, the word became flesh. Genesis chapter 1, and God said, and then God said, and then God said, the creative power of words, he gave that to Adam. So Adam and all of us became another speaking spirit. You and I are speaking spirits. Remember I shared before, I think I shared this with you before, that in Matthew 16 when Jesus said, who do the people say I am? Do you remember that scripture? And they said, well, some say you're Jeremiah, and some say you're John the Baptist, and some say you're Elijah. And then Jesus says, who do you say I am? 
He takes it from the plural to the singular. That was not known at the time of Israel because Israel was very much saved as a tribe, saved as a community, saved as a people. And Jesus is saying, like, okay, we're going, to, we're going to take you from this community thing and I'm going to point my finger right at you. Who do you say I am? And God says to all of us today as disciples, who do you? Never mind what they're saying in the marketplace or the restaurant. Or who, do, who do you say I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Do you remember Jesus' response? He said, Simon, son of Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed us to you. And the reason why he said that in biblical times as a Jew, it was his father that would teach him the Torah. The Torah means the, the law, the five books. And when a young Jewish boy came forward for his bar mitzvah, bar means son, mitzvah means commandments, he became a son of the commandments and his father would start teaching him the word of God. So Jesus is saying, Simon, you never learned this from your father. Flesh and blood, in other words, your, your father, your earthly father didn't reveal this to you. But my father in heaven. And there were Petros. There were Kephas, a rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus recognized by what he said what spirit he was speaking through. Because the scripture says within a few minutes Jesus tells them that he's going to Jerusalem and he'll be handed over to the chief priests. The same Simon took him to the side and he says, no Lord, no, 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 no. no. That's never going to happen to you. And the scripture says Jesus turns and says, what did he say? Get behind me, Satan. One minute, he's the rock. And the next thing, he's Satan. The power of words. Jesus identified what manner of spirit he was speaking through by what he said. So the first group of people were thoughts of men. Peter, thoughts of God, and then thoughts of Satan. That's what we're dealing with every day. Thoughts of men, thoughts of God, thoughts of Satan. Words of men, words of God, words of Satan. This is worth writing down what I'm about to say to you. What I'm about to say to you, write this down. Every time you speak, a spirit speaks. Every time you speak, a spirit speaks. It could be your human spirit, the Holy Spirit, or a demonic spirit. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 18 verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can speak death or you can speak life over what you say. And that's what God was trying to show Adam when he was naming the animals. What you speak, you are now another speaking spirit. Every time you speak, a spirit speaks. So be careful how you speak. You're either going to give death to what you speak or you're going to give life to what you speak. And it's only a mature disciple that learns how to speak the word of God. And when we get thoughts, the thoughts of men. See, they were trying to impress Jesus. Who do the people say? Um, oh, some say you're John the Baptist and Jeremiah. See, 
John the Baptist, Jeremiah, and Elijah were prophets. They were counter-cultural. They were challenging the culture of the day. And what these apostles were saying, you're counter-cultural. We, as disciples of Jesus Christ, are counter-cultural. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're against the culture of the day. We are the culture of the kingdom. And that's why Jesus, the first month I was here, I was speaking to you about the king and his kingdom. Jesus came to establish a kingdom. Kingdom. Dominion of a king. That's how Adam walked. Adam walked like a king. He had the dominion of a king. Genesis 1.26 says, Let them have dominion, rule, and authority. And people say, why is God not doing things? God has given it to us. God gave us this planet. The Bible says the earth belongs to God and the fullness thereof, but he gave it to us. He gave dominion, rule, and authority to Adam. And Adam fell, and Adam rebelled. He listened to another voice, and he lost his presence. And everything about God is about his presence. From Adam all the way through to the book of Revelation, it's about the presence of God. And that's why I love the riches of our Catholic Church. The adoration, the blessed sacrament. Because sometimes in a lot of churches, it's about a personality. We need a presence-based church, not a personality-based church. And I used to say this when I was speaking to Pentecostals. Don't be a pastor-centered church. Be a master-centered church. It's about the presence of God, not so much about the personality of the man. Now, personality, as we spoke about earlier on, is good, it's powerful. You can be human, you can be supernatural and natural, but if you have the supernatural and the personality without the presence... You're a client symbol. Jim had both, didn't he? He had such reverence for the adoration for the blessed sacrament. Even, shh, when you leave here, quietly. No phones, no mobile phones. But he had the personality. He was strong, prophetic, challenged and teaching. So we need both. The presence-based church, a personality-based church, the prophetic, the moving the prophetic, the anointing, the speaking the truth. In love. Yes, so Adam was asked by the Lord to name the animals one by one. And he's speaking to him and showing him the power of words, the power of what you say. That's why when Jesus says, Whosoever shall speak to this mountain, Mark 11, verse 22 and 23, Whosoever shall speak to this mountain and tell it to be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart it will be done for him according to what he said. The power of words. I mean, you study the Gospels, Jesus never prayed about anything, really. He never really prayed about sickness. Jesus never prayed about demons. Jesus spoke to sickness. Jesus spoke to demons. Jesus spoke to dead skin. Jesus spoke to dead legs. Jesus spoke to dead corpses. He spoke Lazarus. Come forth. He spoke to a tree. He spoke to the weather. Shh, quiet, be still. He spoke to the storm. Quiet, be still. The demons, you don't have a conversation with a demon. No matter what celebrity exorcist you listen to, don't, you don't have conversation with demons. 
Jesus says, you be quiet. Come out of him. That's it. Done deal. Be quiet. Come out. You do have a conversation with a demon because I just lied to you. The devil's a liar. He's been a liar from the beginning. You don't allow him to speak. Quiet. Come out. Ah, but did not Jesus ask the name of the, 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 the demon? No, he's asking the name of the person. What's your name? The demon answered. We are legion because we are many. Jesus was just asking the man what his name was. What's your name? The demons answered. And cast him out with a word. You are another speaking spirit. Every time you speak, a spirit speaks. He had before, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie for the pits of hell. Words hurt you. Words hurt you. Some people remember words 40 years ago, particularly women. <laughs> women are historical, not just hysterical. You, 19 months ago, to my mother-in-law the time, Christmas Eve, you said, what? What? I said, what? They remember everything. But remember this. God has called us to another level of walking in his love and walking in his authority, like the first Adam, like the last Adam, and it's another level of faith. You want to go to that level? Yeah. You got a question? Your comment or a question? Yes, because I'm asking you now. What's that scripture is telling me not right? Whatever has spoken will not come back to me without doing what it's supposed to. Isaiah 55. What is it? Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. Yeah, turn to Isaiah 55, then we'll look at that Thank for a minute. You. Isaiah 55. Just came to you. Okay, Isaiah 55, Sharon. Come to the water. Yeah. Come here, all you who are thirsty. Keep going. Come to the water. All who have no money, come. Mm -hmm. Yes, without money and at no cost, buy and drink wine and milk. Mm -hmm. Why spend money on what is not food and labor for what does not satisfy? Listen to me, and you will eat well. You will enjoy the richest of fare. Incline your ear and come to me. Mm -hmm. Listen, that your soul may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant. I will fulfill in you my promises to David. See, I have given him for a witness to the nations, a leader and commander of the people. Likewise, you will summon a nation unknown to you, and nations that do not know you will come hurrying to you for the sake of Yahweh, your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has promoted you. Seek Yahweh while he may be found. Mm -hmm. Call to him while he is near. Let the wicked abandon his way. Let him forsake his thoughts. Let him turn to Yahweh, for he will have mercy. For our God is generous in forgiving. Now listen up, keep going. For my thoughts, For my thoughts. Mm -hmm. are not your thoughts. Mm -hmm. My ways are not your ways, mm -hmm. says Yahweh. For as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from the heavens and do not return till they have watered the earth, mm -hmm. making it yield seed for the sower and food for others to eat, so is my word that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return to me idle, but it shall accomplish my will, the purpose for which it has been sent. Amen. As the snow and the rain come down from the heaven, so my word goes out, and it will accomplish what I've sent it out to do. So if we get the word of God in our mouths and we speak it, it will come to pass. If we really get to that level of understanding his word and getting the promises of the gospel and the promises that he gave us and claim those promises and put God in remembrance, the Bible says that, we can put God in remembrance, Isaiah 62, put God in remembrance of his, of his word. God, you said. Lord, you said. 
Lord, you said. Do you remember when your kids were in the back seat of the car? But Daddy, you said we'd stop at the next filling stage. Daddy, you said. You ever heard that? Convicted by your child. Daddy, you promised. Okay, I promised. God loves to hear those prayers. Lord, you promised. Because God's moved by faith. Tip now. You say about claim and the promises, mm -hmm. and like Jim would have taught us about engraving scripture. Say that again, Dipna. Engraving scripture, as in like. Engraving you know, your heart, yeah, Jim, yeah. yeah. And to me, it sounds like I'm trying to. I could use the scripture to try and manipulate, but it's not possible. Because no, no, you no. still have the will of God, like. Yeah, not if you remained in God of His Word. That's not manipulation, it's God's promise. But I cannot really trust myself because I don't really know what's good for me. I think, is it not better if I surrender my will and say, you know, I want to know what your will is for me? Like, you know? Yeah, you can, obviously that's a good prayer. Always asking for God's will. We talked about that earlier on when Jesus was in the garden. Not my will be done, but your will be done. But when you're talking about prayer, there's prayers of consecration, there's prayers of dedication, there's prayers of faith that provoke the hand of God. God's not moved by need. God's moved by faith. That's worth writing down. God's not moved by need. If God was moved by need, God would move all over Africa and all the poor countries in the world where there's poverty. God's moved by faith. Hebrews 11, it says, it's impossible to please God without faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. That's Hebrews 11, verse 6. Do you want to get it? Sharon, Hebrews 11, verse 6. Let's go flow with the Spirit here. Hebrews 11, verse 6. And it's interesting what the Scripture continues to say in Hebrews 11, 6. Yes, without faith it is impossible to please him. No one draws near to God without first believing that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him earnestly. Rewards those who what? He rewards those who seek him earnestly. Seek him? Earnestly. My Bible says diligently. It's impossible to please God and he's a rewarder of those who seek him earnestly and seek him diligently. In other words, you keep pursuing... You pursue what you want to possess. It's not casual. It's not, when, not now and then. He doesn't say that he's a reward of those who casually inquire. He's a reward of those who visit. Remember we talked about that? He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. Not he who visits. And he's saying, he's saying the same again. He's a reward of those who diligently, who earnestly seek him. Not up and down yo-yo. So many people are yo-yo. Up and down. Now and then. Feel like it. Infants. Infants in Christ. I don't feel like praising. No, neither do I. But God is to be praised whether we feel like it or not. That's why the Bible calls it a sacrifice of praise. Sometimes it's just a sacrifice to praise just to lift your voice to God and tell him you praise him. We honour you, we love you. And that's a different level, again, of walking with God. To walk by faith. Because faith connects you to the anointing. And the anointing will remove burdens and destroy yokes in your life. And that pleases God. Sometimes we read that scripture like, it's impossible <laughs> to please me. Unless you get faith. No, no. This is a father speaking to his children. I'm going to say something. I'll talk about love here. I'd say to you to write this down. This is something you need to remember as a Bible student. All scripture should be interpreted with the character of God in mind. I'm going to repeat it again. All scripture 
should be interpreted with the character of God in mind. And the character of God is love. Sometimes we read the Ten Commandments, you would think this is an angry God. If you watch the movie, The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, it sounds like he's really angry. The Ten Commandments was spoken by a father. Like, as Carmel said last night, what, is this not a way of living? Yeah. God was giving them a, a code of living, and he was talking. Sometimes we don't get the intonation of the scripture. We just read the scripture. And Jesus cried with a loud voice. Jesus cried with a loud voice. That's different altogether. Different ballgame. We, we miss the intonation and the, the drama of so many scriptures. And when it comes to the Lord and it comes to his ways and it comes to how to understand how he flows, we need to understand there's another drama behind the scene. There's an intonation behind God's voice when you understand his character. That God's a God of love. So the Ten Commandments, the first commandment, thou shalt not love. No, no, no. Just love me. Would you just love me with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself? Don't steal for each other. Don't commit adultery. Don't cover your neighbour's wife. This is a father speaking to his children. And he's speaking to them through his character. And his character is love. So when you read Hebrews 11, it's impossible to please God without faith. <laughs> faith is the currency of heaven. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Okay, let's break this down. If the character of God is love, and he wants you to please him. He's saying this. If you get the gift of faith. And you understand the principles of the kingdom. That gift of faith will connect you to my supernatural power. And you'll be healed. And you'll be set free. And you can release words of forgiveness. And you can remove these burdens. The Bible says that the... The anointing removes burdens and destroys yokes. Remember last night I talked about yokes in biblical times that the wooden beam, you would a yoke round a cow, another cow, and Jesus says, Be yoked together with me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, because my yoke is light and my yoke is easy. Why are we going to opt tight? If you're yoked together with Jesus, you're walking in faith. And when you're walking in faith, you're connecting yourself to the anointing and it's removing burdens. It's removing stress. It's removing worry. It's removing fear. And you're walking in wisdom and you're walking in that anointing and that's pleasing to God the Father. Do you get that? Do you get that? It's a complete different understanding. It's impossible to please me. Why? Because when you get faith, you're going to be connected. You no one have any more fear in your life any longer. You'll not have any more anxiety because you'll be walking in faith and that pleases me because I love you so much. It's a different way, isn't it? All scripture should be interpreted with the character of God in mind and the character of God is love. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to jump. Something the Holy Spirit's told me to go a wee bit further. Maybe we'll come back to the, the, the breaking down the gifts of the Spirit. But I want to just keep in this flow because I want to teach 
last few weeks I've been studying this and I really wanted to share it with you. And when I read this scripture, I've read it so many times, it was so challenging to me in understanding the call of God in my life in all of our lives. And I want to share with you how to be a true friend of Jesus. Go with me to John 15. John 15. Because this is mind-blowing. See, in the Old Testament, God called Abraham a friend. Abraham was a friend of God. John 15. Do you know why Abraham was a friend of God? The scripture says, Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Do you know what righteousness means? It means to be in right standing with God. Abraham is known as the father of our faith. And that's why we talk of the power of was. God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. Father of the nations. He didn't even have a child. God calls things that be not as though they were. That's faith. When God said, let there be Light, he spoke and light came. The Holy Spirit brought it to pass. So every time that God spoke in Genesis, creative power was released. You've got creative power in you as another speaking spirit. God is creator. We are created. We are creative. And we're creative by the power of our words. And how we speak. So Abraham was God's friend because he believed God. And God says, this man's in right standing with me. This man is my friend. God called him a friend. Abraham was his friend because he believed God. Abraham got up and leave and go. Leave your family. Leave your kin. Leave Everything behind you. Believe the, leave the thinking of today. That's a great way of putting it. Leave that thinking. And I'm taking you into a new promised land, Abraham. And I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to prosper you. And you will be the father of nations. And he changed his name to Abraham. Father of a multitude. Do you know that every time that Sarah called his name, she was speaking... His destiny. A father of a multitude, your tea's ready. Father of a multitude, your dinner's ready. Father of the nations, when you come in, it's time to sleep. Every time she spoke his name, she spoke his destiny. He was a friend of God. Moses was a friend of God. He spoke to Jesus, God face to face. He was God's friend. Now, when it comes to Christ, these guys are following Jesus. These are young boys. They're learning how to be disciples. And what Jesus says in this scripture, he doesn't say, you're my friends because you hang out with me. He doesn't say, you're my friends because we do life together. He doesn't say, you my friends, because you follow me. It doesn't say to you and me, you my friend, because you go to adoration. It doesn't say you my friend, because you go on pilgrimage to Medjugorje. It doesn't say any of that. This is what he says. To become a friend of Jesus. John 15, verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Ooh, stop. <laughs> Say it again. And you are my friends 
if you do what I command you. That is another level. That's supernatural level. He's not saying because you hang about with me or you do pilgrimage with me. What shows that you're a true friend of mine is your obedience. Coming back to obedience again. You obey my commandment. What was the great commandment we learned in our own? Love one another as I have loved you. You will be my true friend if you obey my commandments. That's what it means to be a true friend of Jesus. And there's a lot of people will go to church and will do this and will do that and do all this stuff and doing things for Jesus rather than living like Jesus. In the natural, let's think about it in the natural. <laughs> Can you imagine going back to your husband or your wife tonight, guys, and say, you will really be my friend <laughs> if you obey what I say, missus. You will really be my wife. And wife, say that same to your husband. You really will be my true helpmate, lover, friend, if you obey my word. And as you're flying out the window, <laughs> you can repent. It's not going to get you far for your spouse. And even your associates and brothers and sisters and friends, you know, you just be a friend of mine if you used to obey what I say. See how crazy it is in the natural? In the kingdom. In the kingdom, this is what Jesus says. Don't call me a friend if you disobey me. And if you're not obedient to my word. Remember again, the character of God is love. Jesus wants friendship with you and me. And he's saying the principle of the friendship in the kingdom is to walk in obedience. That's why when the angel Gabriel came to the Blessed Mother, she just obeyed. Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, he wanted a debate. <laughs> and angel Gabriel just struck him deaf and dumb. He shut him up. This guy's full of doubt and unbelief. <laughs> he wanted a debate. Typical man. Debate the angel Gabriel, the blessed mother says, No, be it done unto me according to your word. Do you want to be a friend of Jesus? Just obey him, just be like him, walk him, walk in love, love the unlovable. Do you know something? The people that deserve love the least need it the most. The people that deserve love the least need it the most. Do you know what Mother Teresa used to say? There's more need in the human being for love than there is for food. And she dealt with the poorest of the poor. And she had a revelation of love. She also said it's like we have an invisible sign over us. Love me. I love you. That's what he's saying. I love you. And I want you to be my friend. And friendship in the kingdom is obeying my word. And if you just obey my word, we will walk hand in hand. And when you start to obey my word, you walk in faith. And nothing will be impossible to you. Nothing will be impossible to you. Friendship with Jesus is obedience. Remember we Elrond we saw from the cross? Obedience and love were the foot of the cross. The Blessed Mother and the Apostle of Love. You want to go a bit further? Let's go to John 14. 
just over the page, John 14, verses 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. That spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he is with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I am coming to you. A little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, and you will also live. Mm -hmm. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever keeps my commandments is the, to us. Keep going. is the one who loves me. Mm -hmm. If he loves me, he will also be loved by my Father. I too shall love him and show myself clearly to him. Wow. If you love me, my Father and I will come and will make a home on you. To draw the presence of God is to walk in love. That's why the Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Because when you walk in, in unbelief and unforgiveness, you grieve the Holy Spirit. But when you're walking in love, you attract God's presence. You attract his presence. And when you're living in a lifestyle of love, God's all over you. God's all over you. He's making his home in you. You become a channel of God. And you get to know what it means to walk in faith. That's why the, the story of the Roman centurion, this pagan centurion, comes to Jesus and says, my servant is sick. The Bible says that Jesus got up to his feet and says, I'll come. Roman centurion says, you don't have to come. I'm not worthy for you to come into my roof. We say it at Mass before we receive the communion. The words, these are the words of the Roman centurion. Because in the biblical times, a Jewish rabbi was not, not supposed to enter into a Gentile home. But Jesus was willing to go into a Gentile home. Because Jairus, one of the synagogue leaders, the Bible tells us, he came and he fell at the feet of Jesus and says, My daughter... My daughter's sick. Will you come and lay hands on her and she will get well? Now watch this. Jesus responds to your faith. Jesus got up, started walking towards Jairus' house. Then comes another woman with a blood issue. She'd been bleeding for 12 years. She spent all her money in doctors. And she heard... That Jesus was coming. Faith comes by. Hearing. John, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. by hearing. Not having heard. It's hearing. It's a continual tense. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes when she heard that Jesus was coming to turn. She said, that's the next step. Do you remember I spoke to you before? True Christianity is not know so, it say so, and do so. She said, <laughs> if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. And then she got down on her knees and crawled into the crowd and touched them. Jesus stops. Who touched me? Everybody's touching you, Lord. No, 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 no. I felt power released. Somebody touched me with faith. Her faith provoked a miracle. And that's what happened with this Roman centurion. His faith was at another level than Jairus. He says, no, 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 you don't have to come to my house. Just you say the words. I too am a man under authority. I say one to go and one to come and they come and they do what I tell them. You do the same. You just have to say the word 
and my servant shall be healed. And the Bible says Jesus was so thrilled. He says, I've never had faith like this in the whole of Israel. This was pleasing to Jesus. Back to Hebrews 11, 6. It's impossible to please God without faith. This man speaking faith. This man speaking kingdom. He knows God has the authority just to speak and it shall be done. I've never had faith like this. That's all your rabbis. This Roman centurion gets me. He understands the concept of a loving, forgiving God. And it's through faith. The God will move in your life, standing in faith, trusting in the Lord, having that desire to obey his commandments and be a true friend of God. There's only two things we're going to hear from Jesus in Judgment Day. Depart from me. I never knew you. Oh, well done, the good and faithful servant. There's only two things. I want to be in that number. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. To be a true friend of Jesus is to obey his commands. And sometimes we invent traditions. Well, I'll pray about that. (laughs) I think I told you a story about these two. Remember I did the last time I was here? These two brothers hadn't spoke for years, a long time. Did I tell you that story? And one brother wrote to the other brother and says, would you forgive me? I'm wrong, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm to blame, but can we meet, can we talk? And he never even answered them, unforgiven. And this little old lady found out about it and met the brother in the street. I heard your brother wrote to you. He reached out to you and asked you to forgive him. He's taking responsibility. Are you going to meet him? I'm going to pray. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds quite pious. And she says, sometimes in the kingdom, you don't pray. You just obey. So the principles of God are not to be prayed about. They're just to be obeyed. And we can invent things. Well, I'm praying. No, no, just obey. Be reconciled. Forgive one another. Love one another as I have loved you. That's the principle of the kingdom, walking in the kingdom of God. So that Roman centurion had a, had a revelation of God's faith. And I was talking to somebody earlier on, I can't remember, but I was saying that if you study the Gospels and the healings, every person apart from one, and I'm going to study this a bit further, apart from Peter's mother-in-law, the Bible says he walked into Peter's house and she had a fever. He took her hand and the fever left. And she got up and she served them. Wouldn't that be good, boys? <laughs> get back to the mother in law and she's got a fever and you lay hands on her and she gets up and makes some, some soup and sandwiches. And she got up and she waited on him. He took the initiative. Every other miracle was provoked, every other miracle was faith. And that's what he said to the woman, courage daughter, your faith has healed you. You see, power left him before his knowledge kicked in. Power's left me, somebody touched me. Somebody touched me with faith. A good study is to study the stops of Jesus. Not just the steps of Jesus, but the stops. Who stopped Jesus in his tracks? Do you remember Bartimaeus, the blind man? He stopped Jesus in his tracks, didn't he? They tried to stop, talk him, tell him to stop shouting. Son of David! Nobody had called him Son of David. This guy has got a revelation. Son of David was a messianic title. Have mercy on me. Quiet. Be quiet. And he shouted all the louder. To eventually Jesus stopped. Bring him to me. Jesus was stopped in his tracks by this man's faith. What about the rest of the blind men? They missed the opportunity. What about the other women in the town that were sick? 
who need their healing, and that wee woman. If I can only touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. Friendship with Jesus is obeying his word, knowing his word, living his word. Remember how I started last night? It's not about what you can do for Jesus, but how we live more for Jesus. So if you want the manifest presence of God in your life, from the Father and the Son, live in obedience. And walk in obedience. And strive for that obedience. To walk in love. And the manifest presence of God. There's a difference between the manifest presence and the omnipresence. Do you want me to explain that to you? The omnipresence is the presence of God that's everywhere. God is everywhere. Amen? God is everywhere. Can you hear me okay? I need to pray for your healing. Your healing. <laughs> Can you hear me, John? Now, you've got a problem with your healing. We'll pray for that at the end. The omnipresence. I felt the spirit of Jim Brown coming on me there. Amen. We'll pray for you. Heal the Lord. The omnipresence is the presence of God everywhere. The manifest presence is when God comes in a special, powerful way. And you attract God's presence by his obedience, by your obedience to his word. Do you know what else attracts God's presence? Praise. God is to be praised. God inhabits the praise of his people. In other words, he comes when you praise. You don't pray in God's presence, you praise in God's presence. You just praise for a wee while, well, Lord, I love you, I praise you, I glorify your name, your King of kings, Lord of lords. You are the way, the truth, the life. You're the lion of the tribe of Judah. You're the first apostle. You're the good shepherd. You're the light of all the world. You're the resurrection and the life. Guess what happens? God inhabits the praise of his people and he comes and that manifest presence comes and dwells within you and then before you know you're starting to walk in obedience. These are principles of the kingdom. Praise, the power of praise, worship. Do you know what worship means? Do you know the Greek word for worship? The Greek word for worship is a word called proskineo. And it literally means this, to bow down and kiss. How many times do you see Jim kissing the cross? <coughs> kissing, 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 showing his love, kissing the cross. Worship means literally to bow down and kiss. The intimacy of the friendship with the living God. You draw his presence and his friendship by your obedience. You are my friend if you obey me. You obey me and my father and we will come and we will make our home in you. That's why... In the book of Revelation, the first church. Bernard, do you want to say something? Okay, let me hear this. Say it again, Bernard. I just missed out on what you said there, manifest presence and the second one. The manifest presence draws the presence of the Father and the Son into our spirits. We attract his presence when we praise him. When we worship him, we bow down and kiss that proskineo, that intimacy with Jesus, intimacy with the Father, draws his presence. But before that, did you say another type of presence? Oh, the omnipresence. The omnipresence is God's presence is everywhere. God is everywhere. But he doesn't always manifest his presence. You go to, I, I remember being a, going, going to speak a meeting and the musicians were killing each other. They were arguing with each other who was going to lead the worship. And the division was toxic. Absolutely toxic. God can't 
function in a toxic atmosphere. Because God is love. And Satan knows the power of God's love. And if he can sow a bit of strife and disunity amongst the people, the manifest presence will lift. That's why when the presence of God came in the temple, they couldn't stand up under it because it was so... Glory it means weight. Glory means weight. The glory of God came. The manifest presence of God comes through obedience and through walking in love. You will truly be my disciples if you love one another. They'll know you're my disciples by your love for one another. They'll know you by your fruits, not your suits. Being a friend of Jesus. Do you want to be a friend of Jesus? Yes. He would say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've really followed me all the way. You've learned the principles. You've learned the principles of being an excuser of the brethren. Baby believers are gossips, are troublemakers. They'll cause strife wherever they go. They're always talking. They're always complaining. Do you know people that are generous with their finances? I've never met a generous person that complained about an offering. I've never met a generous person ever that complained when you asked for an offering. Because we need money, don't we? We all have to live. But a generous person never has a bad attitude with that. But have you ever heard people complaining? They're just after my money. <laughs> Here we go again, another offering. So miserable. Why would you be so miserable? I know sometimes people can be manipulated and they're good at that in the evangelical world, but when you have a miserable spirit, do you know where the miserable comes from the word miser? M-I-S-E-R. Miser. If you really are a true disciple of Christ, you're a giver. Because God's a giver. For God so loved, he gave. He gave everything. For God so loved, he gave. If you love, you can't help giving. And some people are so miserable with their money and so miserable with their finances. And they're complaining all the time. Because they're baby believers. They're believers that are babies, sorry. They're believers that are babies. But mature person, like St. Augustine says, don't speak about anybody that's absent from this table. There's holiness for you. Last night, we were in a conversation about Donald Trump and Joe Biden, the amount of people that hate Donald Trump. I've never heard a, about a president, a president who's so hated in all his life. Now I don't exonerate anything about John, Donald Trump and how he, his manner is sometimes. But I think God used Donald Trump to kick the American people right up the backside. A New York businessman says, you know what, I don't need your money, I'm a billionaire. You're not going to buy me. I'll put Christ back into Christmas. Obama was one to call it the holidays. You're going to take the Christ out of Christmas. He's pro-Israel. He's pro-life. I'd rather vote for Trump. And yet your people, you talk about Trump, don't talk to me about Trump. I said to somebody recently, have you ever met him? I also said to somebody recently, he thinks very highly of you. <laughs> it's always a good one to say to somebody when they're complaining, he thinks very highly of you. If he knew you were talking about him, he'd be very upset because he thinks the world of you. <laughs> Stop some in the tracks. But look at Joe Biden. And people are mocking Joe Biden. And, you know, if we really had a heart for this man, 
you see him walking up the airplane, he fell about four or five times. And people are shouting and bawling, we should never be like that. We pray for him. Pray for Trump, pray for Biden, pray for those who lead us. That's what the Bible tells us. Pray for those that are in authority. But everybody has an opinion about this one and that one, and you've never even met him. I heard a story about a young man during the years with Trump, he, he, his car broke down. Trump's car had broken down in New York or Manhattan, and this man got out of his car, changed his tyre, changed his wheel, and let him go, and he drove away. Trump asked the man for his name, he said, no, it's okay, he said, no, I want to pay you back. He says, this is my car, that's my business. Trump tracked down the man, found out where he banked, and paid off his mortgage. RTE is not going to tell you that story. <laughs> or CNN is not going to tell you that story. And they're not going to tell you the story about Trump phoning people and sending money to them and loving them. I know sometimes it can come over bullish. I feel sorry for Joe Biden. I want to pray for him. Sometimes it's, it's hard when he's so pro-abortion and Nancy Pelosi and some of them are very toxic, but we need to pray for them. That's our call. That's the call of true disciples. Pray for them. Father, forgive them. Father, would you forgive Joe Biden? He knows not what he does. He doesn't know. He thinks he's been a good Catholic. He's a cafeteria Catholic. He's picking and choosing. And when I saw him putting up his rosary beads with the Mexican president, I thought, Lord, please convict this man. Pray for him. That's what it means to be a true friend of God, to go to another level. Don't get caught up in this. Don't get caught up in, I don't like this, and I don't like that one, and him and he, and he said, and she said, and people you don't know. Last month I was talking to a guy in Dundalk and he was a former IRA man. And he cursed Trump. And I said, when I was brought up in Scotland, the Scottish media and Maggie Thatcher in the UK were telling me you're a terrorist. But you're fighting for your country. So the original IRA was fighting against the British. We ruled them for 800 years. Terrorists? Don't get me started about terrorists. Britain terrorised the world and colonised the world and took all their money and all their gold and silver and Africa and jewels. And... But the propaganda told me in Scotland, you Irish are just terrorists. I never knew anything about the black and tans and what they did, how they raped women. What they did to the Irish people. People don't know the history. Because somebody in the television told you. The propaganda. The only thing that we can really go by is the word of God. That's the truth. That's the truth. And Jesus says in John 8, 31, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's powerful. You shall know the truth. And the truth will set you free. And if you read that back, it's the truth that you know that will set you free. It's the understanding of that truth that will really, really set you free. There's a battle today for your attention. All of us, for Genesis, Eve, Adam, Satan's trying to get our attention away from the Lord. That's why we have to be so focused in our walk with Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. Nothing was going to stop him from going to his cross. That's why he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. I will go and I'll be handed over to the chief priests. I'm going to be crucified. 
Do not turn to the left or turn to the right. It does say that. Psalm 32, verse 8, I think that is. I'm going to just, before we pray for the baptism of love, I want you to finish with five keys to spiritual growth. Okay? You okay? And then we can finish at four, and that's us. Psalm 32, verse 8. It talks about, are you got Psalm 32, verse 8? It talks about being led by the Holy Spirit. Turn, turn neither to the left or to the right. You'll be led by God. What does it say, Psalm 32, verse 8? I will teach you. I will show you the way to follow. I will watch over you and give you counsel. Mm -hmm. Do not be like the horse or the mule, senseless and led by bit and bridle. Mm -hmm. Many whose many who woes befall the wicked. But the Lord's mercy enfolds those who trust in him. Mm -hmm. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad. You who are upright, sing and shout for joy. You who are clean of heart. Amen. Yeah, but this is to turn neither to the left to the left in Joshua. And Joshua 1, he said, Do not let this book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Remember that? But meditate upon it day and night. And you shall be prosperous in all you do. Think about, think about that. He's going to battle. Joshua was another level of Moses. I love how the book of Moses, book of Joshua starts. God says, Joshua, Moses is dead. Now then. <laughs> now then, Joshua. Moses is gone. Now then. It should be you and me now, Joshua. Be bold. Be courageous. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but meditate upon it day and night, and you will be able to observe all that's in it. And when you do that, obedience, you'll be prosperous in all you do. There's a rosary right there. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but meditate. Amen? Amen. Keys to the kingdom. Okay, I'm going to give you five keys to spiritual growth and then I'm going to pray for the baptism of love and then we're out of here. Is that okay? Yes. Sorry? Okay. I'm going to pray <laughs> for the baptism of love. But before I do that, I'm going to give you five keys to spiritual growth. Number one, through the God's word. God's word will grow you up. Spiritual food. Jesus said when he was tempted by Satan, Satan tempted Jesus in the natural by telling him to turn the stones into bread. And Jesus responded by quoting Deuteronomy. Man does not live in bread alone, but in every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the Father's teachers that from the same altar we receive not only the body of the Lord, but the word of the Lord. It's the word of the Lord that will grow you spiritually. So the number one principle is to grow in your knowledge of God's word. Have a study pattern. Proverbs 4. I want you to read Proverbs 4 for me, will you, Sharon? Proverbs 4, verses 20 to 27. Number one key is through the food of God's word. Man does not live in bread alone, but in every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And if you don't know what proceeds from the mouth of God, it's because you don't read your Bible. When you read your Bible, this is the words of God. This is the word of God. So read it. And it'll grow you up. Remember I said last night, every time you read the Bible, the Bible reads you. <laughs> Proverbs 4, 20. What does it say? My son, be attentive and listen carefully to my words. Never let them out of your sight. Stop. Start again. Watch my, me. My son, be attentive and listen carefully to my words. Mm -hmm. Never let them out of your sight, but guard them in the bottom of your heart. Mm -hmm. Keep going. For they are life to those who cling to them. The what? They are life 
to those who cling to them. Wow, what else? And healing for the inner spirit. Wow, keep going to 27. Above all else, guard your heart, for therein is the source of life. My goodness me. Keep your mouth from lies, and let not deceit come from your lips. Now, yeah, that's his speaking spirit again. Start at verse 20 again. Listen to this word. Let the word minister to you. Say it again, Sharon. My son. My son. Here again. This is the character of God. Love. This is God speaking to you as a son and daughter of the kingdom. My son. My, my son. Listen. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Remember that in Hosea 4 verse 6. My people. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They don't know my ways. And it's destroying them. My people go into a wilderness because they don't know my ways. That's a father's heart. And he's saying, my son, pay attention. Keep going, Sean. My son, be attentive and listen carefully to my words. Mm -hmm. Never let them out of your sight, mm -hmm. but guard them in the bottom of your heart. Mm -hmm. For they are life to those who cling to them and healing for the inner spirit. Wow. Mm -hmm. Above all else, guard your heart. Guard your heart. For therein is the source of life. Keep your mouth from lies, and let not deceit come from your lips. Keep your sight on what is ahead, and your eyes directed straight in front of you. Test the ground under your feet, mm -hmm. and all your ways will be secure. Wow. Amen. Amen. They are life to those who find them. This book is life. Do you know what the Hebrew word for that means? Medicine. My word is like medicine. We have medicine in these scriptures that we can apply to a life that will give us life and the health to our body. Healing coming through the word. And that's why Jim was continually saying, carve this, engrave this into your heart, this promise, this scripture where you can through things and difficult things. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Are you struggling financially? My God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Philippines 4.19. What does Philippines 4.13 say? Come on, Jim taught you this. Come on. Shout it out to me. Shout it out to me. It's about a thing. No, Philippines 4.13. Oh. I can do all things Jesus through Christ, Christ who strengthens me. Jim taught you that, didn't he? Yes. To engrave this in your heart. To declare that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Say it again. I can do all, all things, things through Christ who strengthens me. Say it once more. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Wow. Life and health. It's the number one principle for you to grow. That's why during the Pre Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, the Protestants took the Bible and we were left for the sacraments. Thank God for the sacraments. But the Holy Spirit has been trying to bring back the Word of God to Catholics since the Second Vatican Council. The Word of God, Dei Verbum. There's a whole document in the Second Vatican Council called the Word of God, the power of God's Word. God said and God said, these are life and healing to your body. When you learn these principles, you will grow. Number two, you will grow through community. You will grow through community. You're definitely going to get prayed for healing. Healing. You grow through community. You're not called to be a lone ranger. Remember I've said before, lone ranger, weird stranger. <laughs> you ever get these folk, they don't go anywhere, they're on their own, but they know everything about everything. Don't walk. That's a, come on, let's stand up, come on. So who's going to start us off with that? So take my hand.
Hallelujah! Don't try to walk this road alone. Don't be a weird stranger. Number three. Through a life of repentance and confession. Number three principle. Through number three. Number two is community. Don't try to walk this road alone. Don't be a lone ranger. And for those watching by way of life, people are watching us live at the moment, try and get here. Definitely for those who are out with the community, the far off, and even people in America are watching us. But you know what? During COVID, people were so used just to tuning in online and they missed community. Don't get trapped in that. And many, many people never come back to Mass. They're watching it live from the house. And that's okay for that season, but it's time to get back to Mass. And that's why we need community. So for people who are watching online who could be here, take the correction. If the cap fits, wear it. No judgment. <laughs> get here. True disciples are in community. Do you know what community means? It means to be co-united. That's what communion means, co-union. Communion means co-union. When we come together for the Eucharist, we celebrate the Eucharist in community. A lot of people that I know don't even consider community. A lot of people go to Mass and it's like no community. I've ticked the box, I'm off. There's a game on. Community. And have that love for one another. It's powerful. I'll grow you up. Okay, number three, repentance. Continual life and lifestyle of repentance. You go to Medjugorje, there's an anointing and there's a charism of repentance and confession and the sacrament of reconciliation in Medjugorje. People get it. And do you know what happens when you go to the sacrament of reconciliation? God is reconciling you not only to him, but to each other. The Bible says that we have a ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5. Not counting men's sins against them. Have you got that scripture, Sharon? We have a ministry of reconciliation. Not counting men's sins against them. Can you read it, Sean? Second, Second Corinthians 5, 19, I think, 20. Because in Christ, God reconciled the world with himself, mm -hmm. no longer taking into account their trespasses and entrusting to us the, minute, the message of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. What next? So we present ourselves as ambassadors in the name of Christ, mm -hmm. as if God himself makes an appeal to you through us. Let God reconcile you. This we ask you in the name of Christ. Amen. So the priest, when he is in persona Christi, do you understand what I'm saying when I say persona Christi, in the person of Christ, he absolves us on behalf of the kingdom and each other. Because your sin and my sin affects the body of Christ. It's like husband and wife having a bit of a fallout and the husband goes to the Lord and says, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have shouted. Or, Lord says, okay, you're forgiven, but are you going to go to your wife and ask for forgiveness as well? It's a two-way. The priest represents God and represents the community. We're reconciled to the community in confession. And I always say this, Confession is a healing sacrament. James 5.16 says, Confess your sins to be healed. Confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. A problem revealed is a problem healed. A problem revealed is a problem healed. Confess your sins to one another and you shall be healed. Healed. Fourth key, loving and serving others. 
The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. He's a servant of God, and that's why he gave them that example. Wash each other's feet. Serve one another. Do you can to love each other. Do you know that Mick serves this community since God touched his life with all that food every Sunday? That's his serving heart. I'm going to free food. I'm going to provide for this. Because God makes you a giver. So you're loving and you're serving one another as a key to spiritual growth. And sometimes it could just be food. It could be finances. It could be just 50 euro to somebody you know struggling. And you may have that money in the bank. Learn to let your money flow. Do you know the Greek word for money? The Latin word is career. It means to flow. That's where we get the word currency. To flow. God wants your money to flow to people. You've always been very generous here. Keep being generous. There's generosity. Sorry, somebody say something. Career. Career means currency. And it means to flow. And the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. First Corinthians 9, I think it is. Second Corinthians 9. God loves a cheerful giver, not a fearful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Smile when you bring your money in the box. Don't be miserable. Sometimes the thought you have, what will I give? Double it. Challenge yourself. I think I'll give her a wee 10 euro. Give her 20. God loves a generous giver. God sees that. When I used to teach, and I used to teach in kingdom economics, and I used to say to people, you cannot outgive God. If you're a giver, God will get the money. If God can get the money through you, he'll get it to you. God will get the money to you and through you. And Jim was a giver. And Jim had a lot of finances. They made a lot of money in the business, didn't they? But he gave it into the kingdom. Listen, if your heart's in the kingdom, your money is in the kingdom. Hmm? Yeah. Amen. And loving God while you're doing it. Don't have a bad attitude. Don't give grudgingly. Do you know the Bible talks about in Exodus that God says to Moses, have the people give, and then he says, only those who are willing. By the way, Moses, only those who are willing, give them the gold, give them their earrings, give them fine linens, but Moses, only those who are willing. And sometimes when we take up offerings in the church, we're trying to make the unwilling willing. It's not biblical. God doesn't want your money if you're unwilling. God wants you to be willing and a generous giver. If your money's in the kingdom, this is kingdom work. My goodness, the resources we have in the kingdom, the finances that people have lying in account, lying in under the bed. We are giving so much bless a community and bless people, bless family. Use your money for the kingdom. That's a principle of growing the kingdom through persistence seek God seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you it's time to grow I'll give you for those that maybe you want to feel a bit being under conviction. Do you know what I mean when I say under conviction? You feel that maybe you'd like a wee bit of correction? Are you open? Okay. I'll give you some signs that gives you the indication you've plateaued. You've remained the same. Okay. And for those watching online, number one, signs that you've plateaued. You don't read the word anymore. This is not to condemn you. 
Nothing I'm saying is to condemn you, but that's a sign you don't read the word anymore. Now, I don't mean just read the word. Sometimes we're busy, but I'm talking even listen to the word, listen to teaching, listen to podcasts. There's so much you can do in your car. Do you know that for the 35, 40 years I've been a Christian, I've never once listened to my radio in the car. Except for my sons, the they maybe listened to the Celtic result when I was in Scotland. I, that's, too, that's too busy for me. I've got too much work in the car. I'm going to listen to teaching. That's car college, I call it. Car college. Sometimes my wife asked me to do the hoovering. And I submit. But see, while I'm doing the hoover, my earplugs are in. I'm listening to God's word. That, even if I'm washing the dishes, if it's something, I, I, this is learning time. It's learning time. Constantly listen to the word of God and teachings. And that's why, remember the last time I was saying, sometimes I preach, I don't know where it's coming from. Probably heard it in the middle of the night somewhere. And it just comes up. Amen? Amen. Sometimes I wish I was taking notes. Because <laughs> it comes up. Persistence. You stop reading God's word or you stop listening to teaching. Number two, you don't get involved any longer. You've gone. You've left the community. You are offended. Offense is the bait of Satan. Repent. You can easily repent of that and come back to God, come back to community. People walking about for years and years with a bad attitude because somebody said something to them that upset them. And that Jim Brown fella, he said this. I'm leaving. I'm gone. Offended. Trapped forever. And Jim couldn't care less. He's on. He said it. It's out of his head. Amen? But Jim would be the first to forgive them. Come back. Come on. Do you know what I was saying to John during the break when I got to know Jim? Jim would always have this appearance of being this big man, but he had a pastor's heart, didn't he? He had a shepherd's heart. And when I left, he says, I love you, Terry. Wow. I stopped. I said to my wife, Jim says he loved me. <laughs> she says, Did he really? Yeah. I love you, Terry. And that stuck with me. What a man who's came from where he came from that can actually tell another man, I love you. That's growth. That's real, real growth. Number three, you're not generous. I'll touch on that earlier on, but you're not generous any longer. You're not generous with your money. You're not generous with your time. You're not generous with your attitude. You're not generous with your forgiveness. Here's one. <laughs> you don't like correction. Who does he think he is telling me that? You don't like correction. It's a sign you've plateaued. This Bible's full of correction. Remember last night? Rebuke a wise man and he'll love you. Rebuke a fool and he'll hate you. If you've got a problem with correction, maybe you're a fool. Did you say that? No, Jesus said that. Don't talk to me. God said that. <laughs> wasn't me. God said that. This is God's word. Rebuke a wise man and he'll love you. Well, you're rebuking him. He's loving you. He said, yeah, I need this. I need this correction. Don't we all? Do you remember? I think, did I tell you the time I shared about abortion when I was pastor? I preached a message about abortion and I preached with fire and I preached the truth and I said inspired by demons to tear apart human flesh and I let them have it and it was the truth what I was saying was the truth but it wasn't spoken in love and this wee lady came in Pastor Terry can I have a word and I thought I'm getting it here I'm getting it because she was such a sweetheart 
and she knew how to correct me. And I used to say to people, see if you want to correct me, please correct me with gentleness. Do it with love. Don't come with a bad spirit. Don't come and say, I'll never be back here. There's no love in this church. Oh. That happens all the time. And she said, I can't fault one word you said. But what I can say is this. You will never know how many women in your congregation have had an abortion. You need to be more sensitive in how you deal with this subject. And it pierced my heart. I was totally broken hearted over that situation. And she corrected me and I needed to correct it. Because so many women have done it. They're trying to do, abort the shame more than the baby. It's less, and it's influences and so much stuff. And, and they live with that for the rest of their life. The consequences of that. Do you know that Moses was a murderer? Moses murdered the Egyptian. And God loved him. And every woman can be forgiven. The following week, I preached a message of grace. And I said, if there's any woman, then please forgive me. Forgive me for my lack of grace and how I dealt with this. And if you're here and you've went through that, please come and see me afterwards. Or four men we can chat. Nine women came to me. Two of them were my niece. One was a sister-in-law. One was a friend of one of the leaders. And that broke my heart. It broke my heart. So be willing to be corrected. And be willing to correct others. But do it with grace. And do it with love. Remember, true biblical correction is motivated by affection. I love you, and I have to tell you the truth. Can you that again? Say that again. What did I say? <laughs> true, true biblical correction is motivated by affection. I'm not trying to, I'm going to sort him. I'm going to put him right. No, it's affection. It's because you love them. So we correct in love and we receive in love. It's another level, isn't it? You talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. There's another principle. That, that just shows you've plateaued. Yeah, I've been with people, just, they're still talking. Oh, well, God's this and God that. I remember being at a conference and afterwards, all these young people were talking, and they talked and 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 talked. There was me and another Bible teacher there, and I thought, never once did they ask me one question. They were talking the talk, but they weren't walking the walk. And sometimes we can do a lot of talking instead of walking the walk. And that's why when people say to me, what about my family? What about my husband and my wife? They're not coming to the Lord and I'm trying to tell them, trying to evangelise them. They don't listen to your talk any longer. You've talked to talk, they want to see you walking the walk. It's not your words that's going to prove your, your family, it's your actions. They want to see fruit. They want to see, has there really been a change in your life? And with family, it's not words, it's works. Not words, it's works. It's initially words, evangelise them, tell them about Jesus, what Jesus has done for you, and then that's it. It's works afterwards. They're watching to see the fruit of your life. And if you identify with any of them, then you can repent. Start again. Plateaued. Remember I told you about that young man phoned me yesterday. He says, I'm so glad you phoned me. I'm nowhere. I'm not even going to Mass. And I'm driving down. I'm praying in tongues. For four hours I'm driving down here. I'm listening to teaching. I'm preaching to myself. I'm praising and worshiping the Lord. And the Lord says, phone such and such. I get the interpretation of the tongue. 
Because when I speak in tongues, I, I get asked for the interpretation of tongues. And I knew that was a word of wisdom. And I phoned him and he was down in the dumps. He needed me to phone him, to encourage him, to get alongside him. And we need each other to encourage each other, don't we? God knows we need encourage. Do you know I've got a bit in my phone called encouraging words? And I write down every encouraging words that I get. And when I'm going through tough times, I just look at them. I've got every encouraging word that Paul, you know Paul there? Paul used to come and see me at Knockbridge, and he used to send me encouraging words, constantly. The Barnabas. Remember I told you about Barnabas? Barnabas was Joseph the Levite. And the apostles changed his name to Barnabas. Bar means son. Son of encouragement. Barnabas was an encourager. He didn't have a big ministry like Paul. Paul was a preacher, but Barnabas was an encourager. I often wonder what Paul would have been like without Barnabas. Encouraging him. You were great last night, Paul. Oh, you had them spellbound. You were great. You were anointed. Encouraging and encouraged him. What a word you gave, Paul. The apostle says, this guy's such an encourager. Well, did he change his name? Joseph doesn't, doesn't explain him anymore. He's a son of encouragement. Where are the Barnabases in the church? There's Barnabases in here, because I know I've done a few one-to-one with people, and they just say, I love people, and we'll start walking in it, make some phone calls, drop a line, email, and just say, I just love you. I encourage you, are doing a great job. That encouraging ministry. Thank God for the Barnabases. Every encouraging word you've given me, Carmel, I've posted it, I've talk copied it and pasted it. The first time I preached here, Jim says, Terry, there's texts coming in, right, left, and send them. Will I forward them to you? I says, yeah, please. He forwarded all the stuff. People saying how much they were blessed. Encouraging words. It's amazing how vulnerable you can be behind this pulpit. And you look, Terry's amazing. Terry's just a man like you and me. But just, Jim was the same. And we all need encouraging words. And ask the Holy Spirit to show you who needs encouragement. He'll show you. He'll show you people just need a word of love and encouragement. Remember last night I was telling you, having that continual lifestyle of love, walking in love. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I just love you. Stevie Wonder, I just called to say I love you I just called to say how much I care I just called to say how much I love you from the bottom of my heart maybe today make a phone call did you say to somebody I know I never told you why tell you I love you you're such a blessing you're such a blessing in my life